studs, leather, chains, Christmas trees? Hollywood's weirdest record label was built on 1980s heavy metal, from furry sided wax to sticking shredded dollar bills into vinyl. Asra Records played with what a vinyl record could be. These vinyl records are more than just the songs from yesterday's heavy metal warriors. They are outsider art, all handmade by one man, David T. Richards. He was just a rock and roll encyclopedia. He basically provided bands a launching point, if you will, that they might not have otherwise had. He gave them their first breaks. We're talking to Jag Panzers. We're talking to Liege Lords. You know, so Dark Angel or Overkill. He was part of them. He's part of their history. Good or bad. Cut into shapes using his buzzsaw, David made his records at night in the record factory he worked at during the day, and then sent around the world from his garage, located in Hollywood, USA. The record compound, the finest pure vinyl obtainable, is fed into the press in granular form. He's under the thumb of the boss, and he's like, I'm going to stiff him, you know, I don't like you. I'll do my own thing. It is forced by hydraulic pressure into a soft plastic in just the right amount for one record. He was probably doing it 2 or 3 a.m. in the morning when they closed up their doors. Yeah, he had this bandsaw, and it was, oh, do you want a star? Do you want a square? Do you want a badge? Do you want dog bone? He, whatever you wanted, he would cut. If it's a shape, how does it play? And when I explain, they're like, oh, OK. <laughs> it's a lot like pirate radio. Now we're ready to roll. So it's basically kind of like your pirate record plan. Like all stories from Hollywood, this one also has many fans trying to split fact from fiction. I've heard that rumor too. I, I don't think that's quite true. He did run the record label out of his garage. We were in his physically in his garage and he had his boxes and he had his picture discs. Where his living room was like stacked up with records and VHS tapes of band. He did some things that were a little weird when you look back on it now. You didn't know they were really happening. I mean, I didn't know that this stuff was going on in the early 80s. So he was creating all these records, but he wasn't basically paying the bands. What it sounds like, he was into some kind of backdoor business dealings that seemed to benefit himself and no one else. One guy with a, with a vision and an idea it's only something that could happen in the 1980s. <laughs> it could have, this kind of thing could never happen again. He was the guy, he was the underground guy. Azra, Hollywood's weirdest record label. Today, the legacy of Azra Records goes largely unnoticed, even amongst most vinyl record collectors. Hello, are you looking for a limited edition record off the wall? Are you the guy? The forgotten legacy of David T. Richards. Dirty, dirty Richards, or what's his... No, I'm not familiar with it. Due to budget limitations, we asked journalist Scott Willis to uncover the myths of Hollywood's weirdest record label. Hello? Hey, I can hear you. To get the inside scoop from Hollywood's 1980s heavy metal scene. You've got the studs, the leather. Is this uh, people's mums having a hand in that as well? <laughs> Yeah, exactly. It was uh, showing our mom's uh, pictures of Iron Maiden and Saxon and saying, how can we look like this? Let me ask the main vinyl expert. Maybe he knows about it. He's looking for some really expert I don't believe exists, but uh, what is it? You might be entertained. You might be upset. All right. We'll try one more guy for you. The best guy. This is Chris, I can help you. Has Chris, Hollywood's main vinyl expert, heard of Azra Records? Uh, no, I actually never have. And what about the myth that these were made in a factory overnight to create a DIY heavy metal empire? And does the factory's boss know? I can help you. Hi there, I'm uh, Scott from Scotland. I'm Scott is the type of idiot that thinks you can just call a multi-million dollar business and ask to speak to the owner. I believe is the founder. Yes. Um, is she expecting your phone call by any chance? Or no, no, this is completely, um, it's out of the blue. Okay, um, I'm sorry, so you were just thinking to speak to the, to the, um, the owner? Yeah. Um, I'm not too sure. With the roster filled with young talent, wearing enough hairspray that would make today's environmentalists squirm, one standout is Rotten Rod. A street talker, no BS guy, whose stage presence was legendary. Singer for the band, Nightmare 2. 
You have reached the voicemail of Hugh Hefner. When I'm finished smoking my pipe, I will return your call. He worked at night at the record pressing plant. He had the keys to the place. He would go there when there was no one there, and he would press whatever he wanted. So, hey, today I'm gonna I'm gonna do these, and you know, tomorrow I'll throw some red vinyl on there. I mean, he just pressed whatever he wanted, whenever he wanted. Hello. Hey there, it's Scott. Scott, how you doing? Hey, I'm very good. Is this Hugh Hefner? This is Rod and Rod. Hugh Hefner's out for the evening. Did you have, ever have any crazy fans back in the day? More than I care to talk about. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah, that goes with the business. He had a, a big house that was completely filled with all the stuff that he pressed up, all, all the records. And he started getting into all those shapes and that kind of stuff. On a very amateur level of the band saw, he, he would have one or two books of artwork and clip art. They called it clip art back before there was computers. And he would just cut those out, and that's what he would use as artwork. I had read somewhere that maybe one side of the record was playable, but on the other side, it would literally just be a page from a book glued onto that side, making it not playable. That's true, that's true. He would experiment at night do, doing different things like that. I, I would say that 90% of the time he had a parrot on his shoulder. He would walk around the streets of his, around his house, he would go to work, he would be in his house with a parrot on his shoulder, like a pirate. Now that you mention it, I have seen that crazy bird on several occasions. Dave had a fondness for three-legged dogs. Oh, that's like quite a caring person then. Yes, he was. Was there one particular show that stands out to you? We did play some shows down in Mexico. It was crazy. There was a, a bar venue that was right next to a bullfight arena, and the bullfights were going on, and across the street we were playing. We used to be messing around, gigging baby dolls and stuff, up until somebody grabbed one and cut the hell out of his hand. Ah! Place, it turned into a big mosh pit. Somebody broke down the disco ball and it crashed on the floor and the cops came and the place got raided we played anyway and we had a great time but it was just it was chaos it was anarchy this is a fun one this is an azra doesn't look like a big deal here but on the reverse and this is actually a material a furry material another azra shape um this is a triangle version but this is a unique triangle version with a maze on the back. It is awesome. It's a great seven inch. It's really cool. And see for me, like this one, this one's awesome. The Christmas trees, I could care less about it. You, you know, Rod, I was really uh, nervous to speak to you because I looked at the photographs of your band and you're holding a sword. You look, you look terrifying. Yeah. I'm now speaking to the guy who owns the world's largest shaped vinyl collection. Is that right? That That is right. 2,000 shaped vinyl records and 5,000 regular vinyl records as well. I tried to get Guinness Book interested in it and they sent back a letter saying thank you, but you know, we're not interested at this time. Tim even has a website dedicated to his record collection <clears throat> and his other interests. You had aliens in your garage and stuff like that? Yeah, well, it's actually a storage trailer that one of my mannequins that's uh, in a kneeling position, in the house, she's fine. But when I put her out in the yard, I have to find something for her to, to put her one hand on so that she doesn't fall over. <laughs> Dave was the kind of guy who could go to and say, you know, I only have $200. Is there any way I can make a recording? And Dave would be like, it's going to cost me 180 to make this recording, but okay, fine. And he'd get them in the studio and do the recording. And sometimes they aren't all that great. <laughs> but, but some of them really are. Jack Panzer has been praised by leading heavy metal magazines throughout the U.S. and Europe for their power and energy and have been described as the premier heavy metal hopeful for the new year.
Jag Panzer. They're just an excellent American power metal band. I was actually lucky enough to see them one time and I thought they were fantastic. Only one of us at the time had a driver's license, so it was, uh, we couldn't all fit in his car. Sometimes our moms would take us. I've heard Dave Richards mention on several occasions that his favorite band was Jag Panzer. He totally loved that band. The first record we did with him was a the square picture disc. And I told him we were poor and needed some groceries. <laughs> and he said, well, we can do a single and I will give you the stack of records and you can sell them and get some groceries. And he did. Uh, two weeks later, he called and we drove down there and picked up a box of 200 of these square picture discs. And uh, I started calling record stores and we sold them all and we got our groceries etched into the vinyl it says the drummer is a virgin <laughs> you're the only person that's ever mentioned that yes he would complain all the time i need to find a girlfriend i need to find a girlfriend we said get out and get one. Oh, i'm too shy get out and get one no i'm too shy uh, <laughs> i'm laughing so hard you're, you're the first person i think that's even seen that <laughs> hey hey <laughs> sad thing is is that as good as they were they never really got the recognition that they deserved it was kind of like they were completely overlooked i've made every mistake in the music business you could imagine I mean, every one of them i've read about other bands making mistakes i'm like yeah i did that too dave richards and azra that's more of a niche market a lot of the shapes and color vinyls i mean i really like dave a lot and i have a, a fondness being on the label and good memories but we really needed a bigger label and we had a lot of large record companies were coming out to see us. So we had a lot of interest. So we thought, let's try to get a really big record deal. Looking back, that was a huge mistake. We should have just took the best offer we got. So we thought, you know, let's try to get a big deal. And that big deal never came. So that album didn't come out. I mean, he did some good stuff, and, and then he did a lot of, you know, garbage. He was just put stuff out, and, and hey, if something sticks to the wall and, and gets famous, then I get paid. Do you know if there's ever been any sort of difficulties between Dave and the bands that he was putting out? It would surprise me if there hadn't been. May you get butt f by a rhino with AIDS. <laughs> I do remember that, actually. <laughs> uh, it's been a while since I heard that. As time went on, some of David's bands would accuse him of not paying for records released, allegedly selling multiple variations of their records without their knowledge. May you get butt f by a rhino with AIDS. And that was one of the cool things about records as well is that they always had a special thanks list. You would go through this thanks list and see who they were thanking because it would tell you about other bands. So I always loved that about, you know, once again, digital format doesn't have special thanks lists, right? I've never seen anything. I mean, I've seen, you know, fuck you, whatever on, on back of record records, but nothing is, nothing is egregious and visual. Uh, I wonder how you would feel if you actually got the album and read that about yourself. It, wow. <laughs> From what I gather, he was creating all these records, but he wasn't basically paying the bands. So here's the here's the first. I mean, it's fantastic. Out of all the bands Dave worked with, Overkill is the one that's got the biggest grudge against him. Yeah, there was things like the fine print said uh, black vinyl. Well, then he pressed up blue vinyl copies and shipped them all overseas. No, oh, I didn't. I never knew about that. Um, kind of sounds a little more like you'd be cheating the band. Uh, <laughs> Which, which doesn't sound like Dave, but... Um, you talk to Overkill, well, there, there's five, six, seven, eight, you know, other bands that I can name that were in the same kind of boat. I didn't experience that. I mean, think about that. Now, who are you gonna trust? The band, who we love, or this gentleman? They would have just had to call me and they would have immediately gotten their money. Liege Lord disbanded in 1989. In that time that we weren't playing, the only way that I knew that he was doing anything like that was I would just out of curiosity, I'd put Liege Lord on eBay and I would see picture discs of our, you know, the Liege Lord EP and I'd see all these different, you know, he did a, like a, a Christmas tree shaped single, 
he did um, a warrior, some guy with a, like a you know warrior outfit on with one of our songs on it. I mean, he just got creative and did whatever he wanted. It didn't bother me because you know, like I said, we knew that um, we weren't going to get paid for it, and you know, bands are getting on and looking up their name and hey, yeah, we did a record with Azra. Well, hold on. I didn't know we did four records with Azra. <laughs> you know, it's that kind of thing. It was probably, I want to say, 2001, 2002. Liege Lord was still not playing. And I saw this record on eBay. And I sent the seller an, an, an email message. And I said, I was the bass player in Liege Lord. Where did you get this record? And it was Dave. And Dave responded and said, I'm glad you're still alive. <laughs> I remember that. I would say 90% of the bands that Azra did never left the U.S. So they didn't really tour and they didn't really play outside of their own little towns. So if he was selling records to someone in Sweden, stores in Germany, no one would ever know. Now that the band is back together, when we go to, like, to Europe, a guy will walk up to me with this. Like, how did you get that? And not just one guy, I'll see it. Like, it's out there. He would tell these people, hey, I'm going to press a thousand. Um, after I sell 500, then, then maybe you'll get some money. Well, the fine print would say 500 in the United States. And that's why most of the copies that you see out there on things like Discogs are all in Germany and the UK, and they're not in the US because he would ship them all overseas. And then I begin to wonder, maybe Dave made more than we thought he did. I, I don't think he was really out to steal anything from these bands. It was just, yeah, he found a loophole here and there, and he, he did it. I don't think he got rich off of it. I mean, he wasn't making a lot of money. Anybody that rips off an artist is just beneath, like, there, there's no pit in hell low enough for those people. They're creating an art that we can all enjoy, and they should be, they should be compensated for that. How much money are you talking? <laughs> so it's like, so I tell you, you know, you get fit, we split 50-50 on a heart shape and and we made a hundred of them. And, and I didn't tell you that I made 25 of these squares. 25 of them? How much money am I gonna make? <laughs> The methods that made David's underground records unique have become commonplace industry techniques, often used to make today's limited edition releases stand out from the crowd. The limited edition nature of Azra Records mean they can go for a pretty penny. How does that make you feel as a musician that your albums are kind of collectible and that they go for quite a bit? <laughs> well, I, I, I'm not surprised that the Azra stuff is, is goes for money. If there weren't a lot of them out there, then they're gonna be expensive, they're gonna be collectible. Dave, I'm sorry that I keep having to ask you mostly uncomfortable questions. But anyway, what do you say to the allegation that you have record press as much as you please? That's not an uncomfortable question. On the contrary, it's a good thing that I can clear things up. We've never pressed more copies of a record than we were allowed to by contract. When you're collecting, those types of thoughts never enter your mind about where it came from and all the machinations behind the scenes if you will you're just collecting because one you either like the band or two you're intrigued by the shape but why do you feel that sort of insight is important for collectors then why because you're talking about um the rarity of it and rarity is what drives price there's always something about having that original pressing and it's always a collector's market with the Azra thing, do we even have an idea about how many, all of the different variations and how you don't even know how many were done? Were there 10 done of the Christmas tree and how many different versions of the Christmas tree were done? Alpha note, I've confirmed all the statements, especially the ones regarding overkill with documents and paperwork. And I can assure you that it's the truth. Also, I got a really good vibe of Dave. His main problem seems to being overworked and having to do so much work by himself. Uh, check some of these bands out if you don't have them already in your collection and stay heavy. Fucking, I'm gonna find them. Fucking shit.
whatever was going on with Ezra was a 1980s thing. It was um, outsider art, a little bit of stealing other people's work for his own benefit, but it was also giving people an opportunity. You know, it was a little bit of Robin Hood and a little bit of uh, not. <laughs> you know, he was uh, he was doing a little bit of both, I think. Have you ever talked to Dave Richards himself, Scott? You know, I've reached out to him a couple of times. Hello, we are not available now. Please leave your name and phone number after the beep. We will return your call. But as he's gotten older, we've all gotten older, but I think uh, he just ain't, he ain't as sharp on his toes as far as like returning phone calls or answering his phone. I think he's a great guy. Uh, and I think he brought a lot to the, to the music industry with, with Azra and his enthusiasm and creativity. I don't know why he, he didn't see bigger picture and want to do something bigger and why he just stayed the guy with the garage record label, why he stayed with that, I have no idea. Dave was an underground guy. Next time on Azra, Hollywood's weirdest record label. I think you are an eccentric. You have the world's largest shaped vinyl collection. So, yeah. I mean, because I think some people think that's that's a, a negative term, and I don't find it a negative term. It's just a you know, you're a person who has some odd collections, some odd habits. Um, okay, um, I, I I didn't mean it as a a sort of neg. I, I would say I'm eccentric. I'm chasing. <laughs> no, I'm I'm chasing people all over the world to talk about uh, shaped vinyls. So I I'm definitely in that category as well. You know. Yep. If you're not already there, you're working on it. <laughs> well, thanks again, Matt, for your time. And, uh, yeah, just send me uh, those photos. And, uh, yeah, I really appreciate that. Yeah, don't oh. expect much from the photos. They're just cheesy little photos. Cheesy is best, you know? Okay, okay, you got it then. Yeah, I'm on it. <laughs> cool, I appreciate it. Take care. Stay safe. Take it easy. See you. Okay, yep.